All right, good morning. Welcome back to our series once more we've been doing in the study of the dispensations. I had several of them recorded now on YouTube, and I think this is actually number 14. I'm just going to read a few verses for my text this morning because I'm not going to make it primarily textual, but I want to deal with a topic that has to do with the uh, the subject of dispensationalism and to a certain extent also of the Abrahamic Covenant. So I'm going to read just that initial statement of the Abrahamic Covenant found in Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. The Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy inspired word. I have repeated several times in the course of this study, um, not just in the last couple of weeks, but I guess a number of times, that I don't want this to turn away from a study of the dispensations into the point where it gets just primarily uh, focused on some other theme or, or topic and so to that extent I don't want it to become a study of the life of Abraham that will go on for weeks and weeks though it's very interesting and very profitable so I don't want it to morph into that I want it to um, I want it to be a study of the dispensation now I'm not saying I'm not going to cover anything else concerning the life of Abraham because I think part of the study of the dispensations is to consider the people that were the primary persons in it. So in the present age that we're considering, the age of promise, the figures that are part of that are of course the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and to a certain extent the twelve patriarchs that came from Jacob. But I but I, um, I don't want to just go that. What I thought I would do, and I've also said this a number of times as well I believe, is I thought that I would uh, just focus in a little bit on the Abrahamic Covenant and even going back, stepping back one step from that on the bigger picture of dispensationalism or the study of the ages. And I just want to show why I believe that the study of the ages is an important hermeneutical key to understanding the scriptures and why we, we, why we come to an understanding of what God is doing by the study of the ages and of the dispensations. Now we said before that the Abrahamic Covenant undergirds the um, much of God's plan of salvation and that all fits into what we're going to think about today in regarding the, regarding the, uh, the dispensations um, in general. So I've divided my study for this morning into three parts which I'll just of course, announce the headings as we go into it rather than spend any more time trying to give an overview because I have quite a bit of material to cover. So before we go further I'm going to bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word that you've revealed to us. We thank you for revelation. We thank you for the person of revelation, which is your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God, the one who communicates God to us. We pray, Father, that you would bless in our uh, consideration of these themes this morning, uh, guide and direct in them, that they might be profitable, that they might bring deliverance even to lives, so that uh, people would be better equipped to be able to understand the Scriptures and its proper biblical setting and context and uh, Lord to be freed from systems of interpreting that go against the free and open interpreting of the scriptures with the scriptures we ask Lord then that you bless this in Jesus name Amen alright um, the first thing I want to consider is the eternal purposes of God and that might seem like um, a different way to approach it it might seem um, might, might seem that some people would say, well, why begin here? We're talking about the dispensations. But I'll just tell you, the reason I want to start here is because there is a kind of a tension, I think for lack of a better word, that exists between different schools of Bible interpretation and that that tension, and this, uh, in part at least, relates to differences in the ways that people think about these two areas of truth and that is on the one hand the eternal purposes of God and his eternal counsels and on the other hand how those counsels are being worked out in God's plan for earthly history and it has to do with how we think about those two things that will determine this important feature of our hermeneutics so let's start by speaking a little bit about God's eternal purposes and we could ask the question does God have eternal purposes 
Does he have councils that go back to eternity? Does he have decrees, divine decrees? Does he have elections, choices that he's made? And that's what the word elect means, chosen. Does he have these things? Well, yes, I, I believe he does. And it's not that there's nothing in the scripture about these matters. There certainly is uh, considerable in the scriptures about these matters. And I'm going to just look to a portion over in the book of Ephesians as one illustration. I could give many, um, although perhaps not as many as some people would uh, pretend to when they develop their systems of interpretation. But in, in Ephesians, chapter 1 and verses 4 and 5, it says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And again, I can think of other scriptures that touch on these things. I think of Romans chapter 9, I think of passages in 1 Peter, and various places where this fact of God's foreknowledge and his um, eternal purposes and his counsels are dealt with. So this, this truth um, relates to the fact of who God is, that he is sovereign, that he is eternal, and the fact that he is God because these two traits are, or, or attributes are part of who God is. He is sovereign, he does have his eternal purposes, and he is eternal. So those purposes go back, um, from our perspective, before the beginning of time. So. How do the scriptures um, address it? Or I should say, do the scriptures address these things in any amount of detail? And I think my answer to that is it would be strange if it didn't. It would be strange in a book which is the revelation of God and teaching us that he is a sovereign, eternal being. It would be strange if there was nothing said in it about his eternal purposes. So yeah, it, that the scriptures do address it and do speak to it to a certain extent. And so we could ask another question. Are there some features of God's salvation plan that relate to these truths in a particular way, to the fact of his eternal counsels? And again, I believe, yes, there are. There are some facts of what God teaches us about salvation that are re related particularly to his eternal counsels. In other words, words like elect in the text that go along with that um, refer to the concept of election. That's and, and you can't separate the two. Um, are there also, uh, for lack of a better word, whole time-wide aspects or features of salvation that fit into this truth specifically? I think there are. In other words, there are some salvation truths that relate back to God's eternal purpose and some of them relate to ba the basic salvation of a person's soul, his being born again, becoming one of God's people, without consideration particularly of the age necessarily. And by that I mean that it doesn't matter when people have come to know the Lord and been his children, whether it's in the present church age, or whether it's the Old Testament age, whether it's back in the days before the flood, I believe certain aspects of those individual salvation are related to God's timeless purposes. They don't, they're not, um, for example, God's et the eternal security. All that know the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal Savior are eternal security. They always have been. Even the example of David in the Old Testament when he committed his major sin in his life there that caused him so much grief. And apparently in a testimony about the sorrow and grief of his own soul in the Psalms, in coming back to God and being restored to fellowship, he doesn't talk about being restored to salvation, but having the joy of his salvation restored. So that the Bible teaches a new birth. It teaches being born again, and that once this happens, a person is in that state forever. And part of the doctrinal foundation for this eternal security of the believers is the fact of God's eternal counsels. And the idea is this, that if you are saved then it's in God's eternal counsels. And if it's in God's eternal counsels, well, it can't be undone because you can't go back and undo God's eternal counsels. So that's why these doctrines have a place in the Bible and why they are important for a proper balance 
of biblical teaching. And I'll give you some verses on this. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So he's referring to the called according to God's purpose and that all things will work out for good for them. There'll be no exceptions. It says, for, and then, and then he goes through this process of logic. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So it's saying because of God's sovereignty, his eternal purpose that goes all the way back to eternity past, will ultimately end for every child of God in being glorified. There's nothing that can break this chain that's rooted in God's sovereignty and God's eternal counsels. And so it says, uh, in the next verse, it says, What shall we say then? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? There are other, other things as well, and, they, and they're all kind of um, the ones I have in my mind, or I guess clustered somewhat around these kind of teachings. But over in Romans chapter 11, it deals with the subject of the remnant. That is, ever since man has sinned, those that have truly known the Lord in this world have been a remnant among a larger group and often a larger sphere of profession so that religions develop with with a profession about being Christian but the actual ones that are truly God's children are born again are what the Bible calls a remnant and this also is, a, is related to God's um, uh, election and grace in Romans 11 it says even so then at this present time there is a remnant according to the election of grace so Paul was speaking specifically there about the Jewish people and he was saying that in the Old Testament times they weren't all believers, they didn't all know the Lord even though God had a national plan for them and he's saying in the present time in the church age there are still Jewish believers and he speaks of them as an election of grace so related to God's election is the doctrine of the remnant, there always is a remnant remember the same passage we refers to um, uh, the, the cons well, let me read it. Uh, it has to do with the complaint of Elijah. In his day, he thought he was the last one. It says, Why, well, you know what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercessions to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So God says, No, he said, You're not the last one. There's a remnant. And he, he relates this to his reserving to himself 7,000 that had not bowed the knee. So, yes, and, and I think that for various doctrinal reasons, not just dispensationalism, but for other ones, that some fundamentalist schools of thought have gone too far, and they have gone and denied God's eternal purposes, and denied his sovereignty. And that's just unbiblical, and it doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter whether somebody thinks it's safer to go that way or not. It's not it's never safer to go outside the biblical harmony of doctrines and teachings. That's why God gave them to us. So it is right to recognize these things and it is right to put them into their proper framework of biblical teaching. But the point of how they fit into what we're studying in dispensationalism, um, we ask the question, are these truths then the central key of interpreting and understanding God's salvation plan. Is this the central the central fact for interpreting and understanding God's salvation plan? And the answer to that is no, it is not. It is not. This is not the framework around which we develop our understanding of God's um, salvation plan. And the reason is simple. Because by the very nature, the eternal counsels of God are hidden. They're not a revelation, they're hidden. They're only known to the point where God reveals them. And a large part of his revelation of these things is in the course of time. So to try to develop a system of understanding God's salvation plan on things that we don't know and the things that are hidden from us is absurd. It's absurd. Um, I think it's stated well in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and 29 that contrast between these things that we don't know and the things that we do know because they're recorded in Scripture. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, it says, The sacred things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. 
that we may do that we may do all the words of this law. So he's saying, no, God doesn't expect us to understand the secret things. He expects us to understand the things that are delivered unto us and revealed unto us. So let's not deny God's eternal purpose. Let's acknowledge it. And let's not build systems of doctrine which question God's sovereignty. It could be no, nothing more foolish than that either. And let's understand everything he says about his sovereignty. And largely, it's just largely the, the facts about his sovereignty and about his and about his eternal plans are revelations of his of who he is. For example, yes, I believe God is sovereign, and yes, I believe God knows everything. That doesn't mean I have to say that I know everything, that I'm sovereign, I'm not. I don't understand these things. But I take comfort in that theological fact, for lack of a better word, that he knows, but, so, so we, we could say we know that he knows, but we don't know what he knows. And so to take that body of truth and make it the basis for interpreting his salvation plan, it just seems contrary to just common sense. So let's go from those thinking, those meditations for a moment on his eternal plan. A lot more could be said, and other scriptures could be brought forth. But you could go through a lot of scriptures and not encounter it directly. In other words, you're not going to run into it in every verse of scripture, so that you say, here's the theme that is the key to... I'm not saying there's no value to it. I'm not saying it's not part of the message. I'm saying it is not the primary interpretive key for understanding God's um, salvation plan. So let's go from that back to a few more thoughts, uh, meditations if you like, on the earthly plan of God. So you have his eternal purpose, and then you have his plan being worked out in time. That's the story of this world. That's the story of this earth. That's the story of history, of, God, of God's working out his plan historically and progressively revealing himself. It has been well said that history is, God can say, we can say about history that it is his story. God is sovereign over history. And God is working things out according to the counsel of his own will. And it is in this unfolding of history, and even beyond that, which takes us up to where we are today, even beyond that, some history is pre-written in prophecy, and it is in those events of this world that we see the primary revelation of who God is, his salvation plan, and what that means to us. It's, that's what the Bible is concerned about primarily. So this involves God's plan of the ages. This involves the dispensations. The dispensations are an essentially a chronological study of the Bible that looks at important key parts of that that are an unfolding of God's revelation. So it, is recognize, it recognizes in that division that there are distinct ages and portions of time which God deals in a specific way with people. And those are facts, and, and I, don't, uh, I don't know how anybody could deny it and pretend there's no difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and probably nobody that's serious does. But, yes, heaven is the key to understanding what God's doing in this world, but from the other hand, this world is the key to understanding heaven. And I, I think of this, this is true in a number of ways, and one of the ways that it's true is even in just how this present world was created by the same one that abides in heaven, and he is intended in the things of this world to present shadows and pictures and revelations of the unseen world. And this is applied, for example, in the parables. In uh, Matthew chapter 13, in verse 34, it says all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. And I'm not, res not restricting this truth just to parables, but the parables are an example how Jesus used, as they've often been described, earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. 
And it goes beyond just those parables. That's a large principle of understanding what God is doing in a sphere which we couldn't otherwise see with our eyes. Because many of the principles and truths are unseen, but we see them being worked out in this world which reveals God's story and reveals his program, especially when a person has the Bible in their hand to understand it. And God has a plan for this world. He has a plan for this earth that's very important to his self-revelation. It is true, I believe, that this earth is the center from what we know of God and what he's doing of his self-revelation of himself. This earth, though it seems so small and insignificant uh, in this u universe that we live in, yes, it is, yet it is very significant for the purposes of God who, cre who created it. We can also say that it is in the events that have been unfolding in time and, are, and which are yet to take place, which again fit into the framework of a dispensational study, it is in those events that God has chosen to reveal much that he has concerning his son. So that, in particular, in the, in the study of the dispensations, and for example, where we are now, we have the Abrahamic covenant, which is very key to God's plan of the ages. And the Abrahamic covenant is part of setting the stage for understanding who the Messiah would be when he would come. And even after he's come, to be able to look back through the lens of the Abrahamic Covenant, understand who he is and what he's done. So God has chosen to reveal his son through those preparations that took place in the ages before he was here, through his actual coming to earth. That's where he came. This is where he came to complete his saving work. And also in scriptures that were added after it, such as the Apostle's Doctrine. Um, God's plan for future events. How can we know them from his eternal counsels? We cannot. We have to look at prophetic scripture, and prophetic scripture tell of times to come, and in a dispensational framework of studying the Bible, and I'm not saying that's the only framework. Obviously, people who aren't dispensationalists know many things about the Bible. I'm saying it's a very important one. And in, so when we look at the ages that are past and the ages to come, we fit together a uh, panorama of God's plan for time in this earth. Um, that's dispensational truth. And so God made known his plan for the ages and how in particular seasons of time he is he's advancing to us the knowledge of his son he reveals himself progressively in these different ages uh, we could also talk about God's plan for individuals and nations which are part of the story of the Bible they're very important but they're part of the history of this world they're part of what God is doing in time part of what God is doing on planet earth and those are key to revealing uh, God revealing himself and revealing truth to us. They just are. That's how the Bible was written. That's what the Bible's made up of. Um, and also, of course, and perhaps most of all, God's plan of redemption. How do we know what God's plan of redemption is? We, we, we say that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Well, that's true. God did have an eternal plan, but we don't have access to go back into eternity past and have infinite abilities so that we could ask God about these things, much of it we might not be able to understand. But we do have a book which has revealed God's salvation plan. And God didn't just all of a sudden do a salvation work. For example, even in heaven, why couldn't he have just caused the salvation work to take place up there? That wasn't God's plan. Because his plan for salvation includes not only the payment price being made, but it being made being prepared for and being spoken of afterward in such a way that it would reveal to us its nature and enable us to embrace it by faith. So God's salvation plan, as it was said in the book of Acts, Paul said it, this wasn't done in a corner. He was lifted up on a cross. God wants us to know what he's done and he wants us to know the significance of it, both in the Old Testament and pre-church and pre-first coming prophecies and scriptures and also from those things which would take place at the time and those scriptures which would follow after but in the Apostles Doctrine and that's just the way the Bible is written so it, it, it is nothing unreasonable to approach this and say here's a framework of study to, 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 to put them together chronologically try to recognize the key points which divide them up into various seasons of God's dealing and try to understand what from that and it's been very profitable to people and very helpful to people over the years. In other words, 
the dispensational framework provides a kind of biblical annals of the earth uh, uh, revealed by God you know people write their like Usher wrote his book about the history of the earth and he of course can only write it so far because it's still being written but the Bible gives us the history of the world and some of it is history pre-written and prophecy and to, to suggest that there's no progressive or no connection between God's plan as he works his way through it's just not true God did it the way he did it including the history and the and and the events that are recorded for us in the Bible I mean so much of the Bible is just related to those kinds of things and so for people to say well um, dispensationalists don't believe that people were saved by faith in the Old Testament that's just a straw man argument it's just it's just um, building up the straw man and then blowing them down and saying look people were saved by faith in the Old Testament and therefore dispensation isn't true but that's not connected with it at all any dispensationalist that knows what he's talking about realizes that God does have eternal purpose he understands there's golden or crimson threads that go all the way through that are that are not age dependent faith is not something that's only true now it's true in the Old Testament and we recognize those things but we also recognize the distinctions and that takes us up to the third and last thing that I want to talk about this morning in, in this context and that is the Abrahamic covenant itself so again there came a point in time, and, and in our dispensational study, we've noticed on a number of key events so far in the book of Genesis. Those are part, and those are recorded also as part of a plan of God to reveal Himself. I like what the old preachers used to say that the Bible is an orderly setting forth of God's truth. It is not a random thing. God is not random. God is a God of order and progress, and it's just God chose this way to unfold his revelation. God chose this way that our Bible is laid out with its um, chronological information, with its information on various covenants that were made along the way, and to try to dismiss all this and say it's all about, it's all just about an eternal covenant in heaven and, and that, that they can't, they have no way to look into or know anything about. Um, it's part of the fact that God, God, of course, did tell us that He promised salvation. Um, tells us there that that was part of His eternal purposes to plan these things and promise these things. But we know we we we're not there to look at those events of that time. We all we can know about is what God has said, and He's and and His way of revealing it is not by giving us a transcript of His counsels in heaven. His way of revealing it is by giving a transcript of planet Earth and its history and the spokesmen and messengers that he's put here and especially in the coming of his son which was first foretold and anticipated and now has happened those are those events of this world are how we know these things and a very important part of that is his program of covenants and so the Abrahamic covenant is one of those covenants which is preparing the way we might say for the coming of the Messiah is preparing the way and that covenant is one of the is, is one of the ways that we interpret that plan by promises he made to Abraham and to his seed. It's part of how we understand it, and it's only as we are able to fit together what God has revealed in His successive dealings through history, and it's only as we're able to fit them together together into our harmonic. Um, or harmonizing program that we can say we understand what God is doing in, in the measure that we're able to. So the Abrahamic Covenant is a very important one in this regard. Um, it is out of that that we get Christological truth, I think that's a word anyway, I mean about the doctrine of Christ. Much of what we understand about the doctrine of Christ comes from this covenant which was given at a point in time in the history of this world much that is soteriological which has to do with the doctrine of salvation is related to the Abrahamic covenant and we could speak about other areas of theology too like eschatology and things that are yet to come are related to what God has revealed and laid foundations for future revelations of in the Abrahamic covenant so let me summarize it this way and be plain about it there are connecting themes that go all through the ages it would be unwise for a person to deny that 
it would be on thinking to deny that. Salvation by faith alone is an example of it. But there are also wonderful areas of diversity in the history of the world that are also part of the works of God and are related to the diversity and details of his plans. He make an illustration of this in his plan for humanity. God has made of all, all men of one blood. We're all one human race, but we belong to different nations. And there are varieties within the different peoples and within the nations because God is a God of diversity as well. It's true in the church. All that are in the church share certain things, but there are all also diversities in their gifts and God's plans for them. And so to try to make, to try to emphasize the connecting ideas that, you know, salvation is by faith, to the point where you either deny or neglect all of this detail of Scripture can't help you. How can you understand God's revelation if, you, if a lot of it isn't significant in, in, in revealing God's, God's diversity of his, of his revelation? He's revealed many things to us. And so the Abrahamic covenant in particular, as I've said before, and not that I authored it, it's been said before me, is a kind of a root covenant. And in that root covenant, there is one connecting theme that applies to all salvation, and that is that the seed of Abraham would be the savior of all, and his saving work would be the salvation work of all. So the seed of Abraham, which is Christ, is made very clear in, in the book of Galatians, the New Testament, uh, He's, he's the savior of all. And he's also, uh, his saving work that he did, he, he doesn't do two different saving works, one for one people and one for another, but it's for all. And in that covenant, which deals with these things and lays the foundation for them, it's very clear that God, for his own purposes, does not see the world as just one people, but has a national plan for humanity as well as an individual plan. And in that national plan, he has a chosen nation, the seed of Abraham after the flesh, the children of Israel, and he has an eternal plan for them. So going back to the passage that we read in Genesis 3 in verse 2, he says, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and, thou sh and, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So he said in that first statement that we have of his covenant, I will make of thee a great nation. Now, I couldn't imagine that anybody would seriously propose that that passage does not relate to the nation of Israel. He didn't mean the nation of Israel. Especially, especially when after stating this in the book of Genesis, essentially, all the rest of the Old Testament from Exodus to Malachi is about that people and God's special dealing with them, with the exception perhaps of the book of Job. But essentially, the vast, vast majority of the Old Testament is about those people. The seed of Abraham that came from Isaac, Jacob, and the patriarchs. So how can you deny that God ever had a specific plan for the nation of Israel? And inasmuch as he, he clearly said in the Abrahamic covenant he had a plan for them, to bless them, which plan is enhanced and, and, and expounded upon, to a certain extent, in the Abrahamic covenant and certainly in later scriptures, as we see God's plan for Israel expounded in the prophets, future plans He has for them. So how how could you how could you seriously not see the nation of Israel there? I don't see how you could, and I suppose nobody does. I hope nobody does. Um, all through the Old Testament, they there God's history with them, even starting right from the Exodus itself. Um, was rooted in this fact that they were the seed of Abraham. When the Lord appeared to Moses at the bush and about when he when he was just going to become the deliverer of the nation from Egyptian bondage, it says in Exodus 3.13, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I am come unto the children of Israel, and, and shall say unto them, Notice this, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to you, What is his name? So they knew that they had patriarchs that were the fathers of their nation. It tells us in the book of Romans in chapter 9 of whom are the fathers, the nation of Israel there. And so you couldn't, you couldn't seriously question that God had a special plan for the nation of Israel. You, you, you couldn't call yourself, you couldn't yourself call yourself knowledgeable of the Bible in any way 
and deny that God had a special plan for Israel that was actually incorporated into the Abrahamic covenant. And I think probably nobody does. But this is where, it's at this point, that one important truth needs to be clarified, which is confused by many people, and that is that God still has a plan for Israel. In other words, the disagreements and the confusion about the Abrahamic Covenant and, and about the doctrines that relate to it, such as prophecy, spring from this one truth. What about the future of Israel? And yeah, you couldn't very well deny the past if you had the whole Bible in your hand, if you had the Old Testament in your hand. You couldn't deny the past. So, it has to do with the future. And so some people feel that um, God is done with Israel. However, I believe the proper understanding of God's plan of the ages, including doctrines of prophecy and other ones, rest upon this foundation that God is still, still does have a plan for Israel. God has a future for Israel. And that one consideration is the litmus test as to whether or not there is a proper understanding of prophetic events in these things. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that people don't know certain other areas of the Bible teaching and, and are wrong in this. Obviously there's been large tracts of professing Christianity that have been wrong on it. However, <laughs> it's, it's still the foundation and still uh, is a basis upon which if you go astray here you miss out a large body of Bible teaching. So this is the cornerstone in the litmus te test of understanding God's plan of the ages. But many, as I said, have, and there's different names for it, like replacement theology, and basically there's quite a number of professing, quite a large swath of professing Christianity which believes that God has pulled a kind of a switcheroo, that the promises that were made to Israel were lost to them because of their sin, and that God is fulfilling them, that he has replaced the fulfillment of these promises to the church rather than to Israel. And you may say, oh no, I don't believe exactly like that, and I don't doubt there's variations and shades of variations on it, but it more or less centers around that idea that the church is receiving these promises God made to Israel in the Old Testament, and the children of Israel have lost them. However, as again, I believe that if you believe that, I believe that you are committing uh, you are committing a interpretive error, a very grave interpretive error. And, and I, I have a number of perspectives upon which I approach that question, does God have a plan for Israel? And I don't have time today to go over them all. But one of them, in other words, when you look at Bible teaching, it should all harmonize and it should all fit together and should make sense. Because it is a revelation from God and there is order and beauty in it. So the question I have first of all is how can you believe that God's promises that he's made to Israel rooted in the Abrahamic covenant will not be fulfilled when we discover in the New Testament that our own promises in this church age as those that are come from among the nations, the Gentiles, that those same promises are rooted in that same Abrahamic covenant and there is clearly a parallel between what God promises us and what he promises Israel in the same covenant. How could he make a promise to Abraham concerning two peoples, Jews and Gentiles, and how could we as Gentiles make certain claims for ourselves based on the nature of the covenant and deny those same privileges and truths to Israel that are side by each in, the, in, the, in that covenant? So, in Genesis 12 and verse 3, and it's very clear that here in this covenant, he made a distinction between the two people. So, God told Abraham, says, through you is going to come the seed, the promised seed, the Messiah. And through that Messiah, this is in very um, initial form here, there's not a lot of detail in it, but will all the nations of the world be blessed? And also, of course, the people, your own people, be blessed. And so in verse 2, it's about Israel. It says, And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make the name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Uh, again, like I said before, I wouldn't take anybody seriously as being serious if they denied 
of the Jewish aspect of that. But the next verse says, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So that Abrahamic covenant, uh, in its anticipation of the saving work of the Messiah, made specific statement of it, the, be the benefits of it extending beyond Israel and going to the Gentile peoples of the world. And this is not just my interpretation of it, it's the Apostle Paul's in the book of Galatians. Because he says in Galatians 3 and verse 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So, if you're over in Exodus, he says uh, very clearly, or sorry, not Exodus, but uh, Genesis, he says, um, In thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. He refers to it directly here in Galatians as the sureness that we would be able to enter into those same Abrahamic blessings. They which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. In thee shall all nations be blessed. And he's applying it to Gentiles, and he's applying it to us even now in this present church age. So that we do have a claim on that salvation according to the original promises of God and that root covenant of Abraham. Now, the lesson here that I'm trying to share is that the character of our salvation we find relates to the character of that promise. So if we can claim that we have a sure and eternal salvation based on the nature of the Abrahamic covenant, how can we say that the same promise of blessing that was made to Abraham's own seed, that is to say national blessings one day, would be, would be pulled out from under them, that they would no longer have any national hope. It's just, it's not rational. It doesn't make sense. And in fact, um, it, when, when, when um, this is, again, this has to do with understanding how, how God planned his, his covenants and how he's planning this history of the world and the two people groups of Jews and Gentiles and how he's appointed them to fit into it in that one salvation through uh, through his son, and there are many parallels between them. And it's in fact, it's because there are many parallels between them that we can look at Old Testament scriptures that are primarily and first of all to Israel and recognize the parallel in God's dealing with us today. God's redemptive purpose has many par parallels and even equalities in how He deals with His children. So when Paul, when I shouldn't say Paul, whoever wrote the Book of Hebrews wrote it. He was speaking, it was a church age epistle, it was about Christians. But he's showing that God never intended the Abraham or the sorry, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant of law, to be the basis for even the blessings that would come to Israel. So he made a covenant to Abraham, which is a covenant of promise. He made a covenant of the law, which had to do with their Old Testament experience and their possession of the land. But he said very clearly that that would not give them an abiding or a full um, fulfillment nationally of the Abrahamic covenant, but rather that God would bring them into what he calls a new covenant. And so in Hebrews chapter 8, and the argument here is basically showing that the, the covenant of the law is not the final end, but that God planned the new covenant. But he shows that it was with Israel in, in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, speaking of the priests, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that they make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. So that was the Old Testament, it had a purpose. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So he's saying, when Christ came, brought the end of that Mosaic economy and law and dispensation, and Christ brought in a better order, it says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So the Old Testament prophets clearly taught that Israel looked for a new covenant in under which they would enter into a fullness of inheritance rooted in the Abrahamic covenant. That's as simple as that. So in the book of Galatians again, when Paul was writing to the book of Gal to the Galatian Christians who were having a trouble 
with preoccupation with the law and being confused about how they related to the legal covenant, God corrected them and said, no, 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 the law, just because it came later than the Abrahamic covenant, that's not the important covenant. But actually, he said, the, the law could not supersede the Abrahamic covenant, and the promises of the Abrahamic covenant stand good despite failures under the law. So we might say today that Christians fail and break God's law, but we don't lose our salvation because it's never been by the law. It wasn't by a legal covenant. It was through the Abrahamic covenant. That was the, that's the nature of our salvation, um, our salvation promises. They're they're like the Abrahamic covenant. They're 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 based on promise and not by works. They're based on God's promise received by faith and given by grace. So in Galatians chapter three. In verse 16, he says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one, into thy seed, which is Christ. But notice as it continues, he said, And this I say, that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, that's the Abrahamic covenant, confirmed in the seed, and that's Christ, he says, The law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that he should make the promise of none effect. He said, yes, there was a law and it had a purpose, but it was temporary and it cannot disannul the salvation promises that are spring out of the Abrahamic covenant. Um, and, he, and he goes on to, to say, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. In other words, um, some say, well, Israel failed. And what covenant did they fail under? They failed under the Mosaic covenant. That's brought out again in the book of Hebrews. But if we can't lose our salvation by breaking God's law, how can the promises God made to Israel in the very same covenant be taken away from it? And you, it's not enough just to say, what well, was the individuals? It's very evident, if you just read your Old Testament, that God had a national plan for Israel. He has not had that plan with any other nation. It was a national plan. God dealt with Israel as a nation. And in the Old Testament times, they weren't all believers. They weren't all believers, but there was, there was a certain sense in which they were part of that uh, national plan. Now, in eternity, only those that are believed will be part of the people of God for eternity, and there will be lots of unsaved people from Israel's Old Testament experience. But nevertheless, he did have, it was the, it was the nature of that covenant, the nature of that age. So, just a further few comments regarding Israel. Um, as I said, I have a number of perspectives in which I can share this truth that God still has a plan for Israel. And it amazes me that how anybody could look at the history of modern-day Israel from 1948 to the present time and not see the hand of God in that and not recognize the preparation of Israel for last-time events. I, it's, it's You just read the uh, biographies of some of the people that were there during the War of Independence and some people since then, and unbelieving Jews can't help but recognize, well, there's more to this than just Jewish nationality. There's something to this, and there is something to it. It's like in the Valley of Dry Bones, God is bringing the bones and the skin together, and He is bringing Israel back to the nation. And, and one day, He's going to breathe life into them. So, just um, a few, few more comments in closing on Israel. There are many perspectives upon which you can you can deal with this theme, and one of the most compelling ones is comparing this first and the second coming. In the first coming of Christ, it was based on a preparation in the Old Testament scriptures. So the Old Testament scriptures made certain promises, promises rather, and and prophecies that applied to the first coming of Christ, and they were fulfilled literally, not spiritually, literally. There's spiritual truth in all things. But there's a literal sense to these things, which is literally true, and it literally happened. God said that he would be born of the seed of David, and he was born, you know, of the family of Israel, the tribe of Judah, of the seed of David. He fulfilled those prophecies, literally. Micah said he would be born in Bethlehem. The unbelieving Jews of that day knew it. They knew the Messiah would come into Bethlehem, and they believed it literally, and they were right. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Out of Bethlehem he would come, and they understood it was his birth. And he, the character of his person, that he would be God manifest in the flesh, as Isaiah spoke of. That was fulfilled literally. So we would say, well, how could he be God? How could he be God with us? Well, he literally did become God with us. So the incarnation, and all these truths, and there's, there's all kinds of other ones we could say, etc., etc., etc. They were fulfilled literally, and they were part of his credentials when he came 
that he was the real thing, that he was the Messiah. Um, now, we all know from our Bible teaching that he's coming again. It's a fundamental basic of Christianity. So he's coming again, and we also know that the Old Testament scriptures, in foreseeing his coming, saw both sides of it. So they saw his first coming, and those prophecies were fulfilled when he came in Je by Jesus. So what foundation could you possibly have for saying the old, the new, the first coming rather, would be fulfilled literally and were part of his credentials for being the Messiah? But when it comes to the Old Testament, when it comes to a second coming, sorry, I'm getting my comparisons mixed up. When it comes to a second coming, then we can't believe that it's going to be literally fulfilled. The fact is that Jesus himself warned them that people would come under false pretenses and pretend to be him. And he challenged them and admonished them to pay attention to their Bibles so that when he would come, he would be recognized by those Old Testament credentials. In Matthew 24, the well-known Olivet Discourse, the prophetic message of Jesus, and said in verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So uh, Daniel spoke of this abomin abomination of desolations. He said, that's going to happen. And when you do, then those Jews that are alive at that time need to flee to the mountains. And you can go down through there. And For example, in verse 24, it says, For there shall arise false Christs and false, uh, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. And he goes on to say and how, how, how he would come, and it would be, he would come that way. And I say this because in just as the prophecies of his new coming, of his first coming, excuse me, were um, involved details and specifics, so did his second coming. So when you read the promises of his second coming in the scriptures, they're over and over related to the deliverance of Israel as a nation. And they're entering into their glory. Their, their promised kingdom glory, their... their the kingdom age. It's there black and white. So when you read passages like in Zechariah, this is really a very clear one in this matter, and it isn't the only one certainly because the, the Old Testament is full of promises related to the second coming and the restoration of Israel, but in Zechariah 14, for example, we have a verse which we know very well is second coming. Verse 4, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is in which is before Jerusalem. On the east, the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst of them. So that's talking about his return to earth. His feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. But the passage before that repeats that phrase over and over and over again. It says, in that day, in that day, in that day. And many of the details of that day have to do with the restoration of Israel. In Zechariah 12 and verse 3, it says, and in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So it's, again, in keeping with the knowledge that there's going to be those events of the tribulation, there's going to be that gathering together on the Armageddon, uh, and, uh, but it's followed by the restoration of Israel. They're going to be delivered. Verse 6, In that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheaf. And they shall devour all the people round about in the right hand and on the left. Uh, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. If you found that connected with the first coming, you would expect that to happen, like it says, because everything else did. So what right do you have to go and to dismiss that and say, no, no, from now on we're just going to look at it in spiritually, whatever that is. I mean, there's all kinds of spiritual truths from Scripture, but it doesn't do it. And you can go back and I don't for the sake of time, I won't read them, but over and over it says all these things. Verse thir chapter 13, verse 1. In that day shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. There will be a national repentance. One by one, everyone individually repenting, because it says there all the different houses apart and everybody apart. Land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, the wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, the family of the house of Levi apart. It's not some just um, corporate thing without thought of the individuals. But the result will be all those ones that come through that time will turn to Christ and there will be a national experience where they will all recognize the Messiah and then because they'll be right with him in a faith relationship they will be ready to go in and experience the promises of the Old Testament. Um, so what about these 
the figurative use. Is there a figurative use? Yeah, there are parallel, there's parallels, there's types, there's allegories, and many things. But it doesn't change the literal sense of it as well either. So we learn by God's dealing with Israel about God's salvation ways. And we take those principles and claim many of them word for word. Not everyone, but many things. We just make Old Testament quotes about our salvation because there's so much in common between it. But how can we claim those in regarding our salvation when they were first of all made to Israel and come to the conclusion they won't be fulfilled for Israel? If they aren't going to be fulfilled for Israel, God won't be keeping those promises and we wouldn't be able to have them either. We wouldn't be able to trust them. It's because God made them to Israel and will fulfill them to Israel that he will also fulfill them to us. And I, again, the time fails me. I don't have time to go into other scriptures, Romans 9, 10, and 11. It just, it's clear. It's clear of how Israel fits into Paul's gospel and his plan, uh, his, his unfolding of God's gospel plan there. Um, that would be, you could do that verse by verse. And I've taught through it many times in the past. It's very clear. And so I would encourage you to not maybe be led astray by somebody that calls himself a dispensation with his kooky ideas, but recognizing in the study of the Bible chronologically and recognizing key events, there's a systematic unfolding of God and of God's Son and of His salvation purposes.